you would open your Bibles, if you didn't already, to that passage Cliff just read for us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start there in just a minute. Uh, this week, we're coming to the end of uh, a pretty, pretty long time where we've, as a congregation, been studying through the letters to the Corinthians, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians. And this has been great, I think, for us to reflect upon the lessons that were taught there. There's probably a lot of similarities that we share culturally in this place where we live with Corinth. And that's why we spend a lot of time on these things. There's a lot of questions they had that we have. There's a lot of issues they face and have to deal with that we have to deal with. And I'd like us to consider this uh, phrase that we, that's at the end of the reading that Cliff just gave for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't know, maybe... maybe uh, Maybe it stood out to you, maybe it didn't, but I'm going to make it stand out to you now. So here we go. In verse 31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is a significant phrase. One, it's just a, a curious thing. The Bible is telling you to boast. You should boast. So that's a little weird because I don't know that a lot of us think of boasting as something really a good thing to do. The other unique thing about this phrase is that it's only found in the letters to the Corinthians. And it bookends these letters. It's found here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And the other time is found almost at the end in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, all the way near the end. And so it's this phrase that sort of holds up all the instructions that Paul gave to this, uh, this congregation. And I think if we understand uh, the meaning of this notion of boasting in the Lord, it actually will help us to understand how to carry out Many of the other things that have been taught about sexuality and money and relationships with other people and um, religion and religious practices and serving others, all these things are bound up in this phrase, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. All right, so first, let's actually just talk about the notion of uh, boasting and what it means. When you think boast, what comes to your mind? What do you think about? What do you imagine whenever you think about somebody who's boasting? Bragging. Probably a lot of you bragging. And probably a lot of you thought of somebody that you know who's a boaster, who's a bragger. They're always telling you about something, about they've done or they've seen or uh, whatever they have or they think. Uh, they're a boaster. They're a bragger. Okay, and that, that is actually one way the word gets used biblically. But there's actually a little bit of a broader range. And actually, the more you think about it, there's a broader range even in the way we think about the word boasting. One way this word gets translated, matter of fact, if you're reading from an older translation, some of you may be reading from something like King James or one of the other, it might say, let him who glories, glory in the Lord. Let him who glories. Okay, so that's a little bit different because boasting, we think primarily just about the words that we say, but for somebody to glory in something, some people you see, they glory in something and you already know what it is without them saying a word, right? Somebody, perhaps it's the way they dress or the way they carry themselves or the car they drive or the whatever, how their house is left. There's a sense of glory. This is something that I think is special that gives my life some weight and significance and meaning. So glory is another uh, synonym there. Uh, another word that would be a synonym here would be celebration. Now this one's a little bit boasting. Like, Ooh, boasting, that's not good. But what about celebration? You know celebrating is basically boasting. Whenever something good happens and you celebrate it, you're making it known. You're, and, and, and I should say this. You're not even making it. Well, I guess you are making it known. But it's not like some intentional thought. You're like, I'm going to celebrate right now. Celebration is normally something that just happens because something good happened. And there's a boasting that comes with that. Uh, a declaration of good things that have happened in your life. That's why another word that actually in some translations, in some places, this word that's translated boast is also translated rejoice. To have joy in something. You're excited about it. And hasn't that been the case for you? You boasted about something. Not in the sense of, ha-ha, I'm better than you, which I think is how we, that first way we were thinking about it is usually everything. But, hey, look at this great thing that happened. I'm celebrating something that's occurred in my life or something that's true. I'm rejoicing. I'm boasting in it. We boast whenever, um, whenever we write out our resume. You're boasting in something. Your education, your experience, and not in a braggy sort of way, but you're just saying, hey, Here's good things. Here's things I glory in. As I come to this position, I think I can do it because A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, we boast on our dating profiles. You put your interests, the things that are important to you. You put a good picture, not one of those nasty old pictures of you. You put one of those good pictures of you because you're boasting. You're trying to say, hey, here's at least the best version of me. 
we all know it's not the real, real version, but it's the best version of me. Um, people boast whenever they go to uh, political rallies, and not even, again, in a braggy sort of way, but hey, we're excited about this movement or this idea or this individual who may do something good for us. There's a boasting that comes with that, celebration and the, you know, the, the signs and the stuff and all that kind of thing. Maybe one of the easiest ways to think about boasting is when you go to a sporting event. Everybody that's gathered there, what are they there to do except to boast about their squad? This one hits home for me a little bit. Whenever, uh, it was several years ago, so I, I, I was trying to remember, I think it's the 2015-2016 season. It was the Warriors 73 win year, right? My little brother Isaac, who's not really little anymore, but at the time he was. He was about 10, 11 years old, something like that. Big Steph Curry fan, which kid wasn't then. And so we were in Atlanta, so I said, hey, come on, we'll go. I'm a big Hawks fan. I had some tickets. Let's go to this Warriors game. So he comes. And, uh, of course, you know, so at this point, just for the visual, right? So this is, uh, I'm, I'm like, what, 26, 7, 8, I don't know, whatever, in that range. A grown man. And this is a child. Now, nobody knows this is my brother. So we sit down, and we're, because it just looks like a dad and their son, because I looked older than probably I really even was anyways. So we're sitting there, and, uh, and of course, you know, Steph's just bop, 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 draining threes. Clay's out there doing his thing. And uh, so he's like, oh, yeah, because we're just having fun. He's boasting in his team. But then we came back. The Hawks came back. We started hitting it. And I remember Tabo Cephalosha hit a corner three that put us over the top at the end of the third quarter. So I'm like, oh, what do you think now? Ah. And then I realized, I need to stop. Because two things. Number one, we might actually win this game. At first, I was boasting, just being silly. But now we might actually win. And I don't want this kid to be crying the whole way home. Also, I'm a grown man boasting in the face of this little kid. What is going on here? i got to stop. But y'all know, that's, that's kind of the image, right? It wasn't even we were trying to be mean to each other or whatever. We're just excited. We're happy. We're rejoicing. We're celebrating. We're boasting. Because we thought that team out there was about to do something for us. And so we were boasting in them. Whatever you boast in is the thing that you think does give your life meaning and significance and will take you to an even greater place of meaning and significance. Whatever you boast in is the thing that you think does give your life meaning and significance and will give your life meaning and significance in the future. I'm going to say it one more time. Whatever we boast in is the thing that we think does give our life significance and or will give our life significance in the future. Matter of fact, fun little fact here. One of the words that's translated for boast in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the root word of that is the word for the other side. Which is like, what, what is that? how is that the root word of boasting? Except isn't that what a lot of us do? Whenever we boast, we're boasting about what we think is going to happen. What's, this thing's going to take me to the other side. It's going to take me to somewhere better. It's going to take me to a place where I'm something or somebody. That's what I'm boasting in. Now this text says what we're supposed to do is boast in the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean we just walk around bragging all the time about Jesus? You should brag about Jesus. He's worth bragging on. But I don't, uh, I don't believe that Paul actually says that's what it's primarily about. Look actually in this text, and what we'll do is we're going to look at this text and see uh, kind of the profile of what, what boasting in the Lord does not look like and what it does not mean. And then we're going to go over to 2 Corinthians and look at what does it mean in terms of the kind of packaging in your life. Because it may be a little hard for us to get our hands totally around. What does it even mean for me to be boasting in the Lord? And what exactly am I boasting in? Am I just saying good things about Jesus or is it a little more than that? So let's first look at the things that do not accompany boasting in the Lord. And then we'll look at the things that do accompany boasting in the Lord. And then finally, we're going to look at where this quote comes from. Because Paul didn't coin this. You may actually see in your translation it may be in a different font or in bold or italics. Because he's actually quoting from another passage in Scripture that I think really helps us bring all this together. All right, so 1 Corinthians 1, uh, the text that Cliff read for us, beginning in verse 26, Paul actually tells us a lot of things that don't, uh, should not, do not accompany boasting in the Lord. He, he does this by pointing to the Corinthians. Say, hey, look at you guys. You know, At some point, y'all decided you were going to make your boast in the Lord. You were going to devote yourself to the Lord. You were going to be all about the Lord. So what that means is you were not people who were wise according to the flesh. One thing that doesn't go along with boasting in the Lord is worldly wisdom. Mm -hmm. Thinking that I'm smart because of, you fill in the blank, with whatever the thing is that you think 
will take you somewhere that gives your life significance or will give your life significance, the thing that you celebrate and rejoice in. Worldly wisdom isn't really that thing. And I'm not even just talking about some big education. It may be that. But whatever wisdom you think you have that is, frankly, of this world, this world-bound, earth-bound, that's not leading you toward boasting in the Lord. Another thing is uh, human power. Um, I wish I could remember. Cliff, could you remind me what the, what the phrase was there in 1 Corinthians 1? It says, uh, I, I liked what the way yours read there. It said, not many were wise according to the flesh. Mine says not many mighty, but I think yours said influential or something like that. Yeah, influential. influential, that's great, yeah. So power, right? You have some sort of influence, some sort of strength in this world. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that you can exercise power. It may be financial power. It may be uh, social power. It may be whatever it may be. Uh, there's all these ways that we try to, or we may use to boast in, our, in that thing. Look, I've got this wisdom, or I've got this influence, or I've got this power, and that makes me somebody. The other thing that he says doesn't accompany boasting in the Lord is uh, fleshly nobility. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. And that may be, uh, some of your translations may say, of noble birth. So it could be, hey, it's not about being born coming from a certain line or lineage. It's not about that. But it's also not about maybe your associations. We may not care as much about, oh, what's your bloodline? That's not as big of a deal in our culture and our society. But who you're associated with gives you a sense of nobility or it eliminates some sense of nobility. Are you associated with the right people? Do you have the right social circle? Actually, Paul goes on and, uh, and says some more things at the beginning of chapter 2. He's talking about them in verses 26 and 27. But look at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. What else does Paul say is not really part of the life of boasting in the Lord? Well, it's not being somebody who has lofty speech. And of course, we know it was certainly true in their culture. It's in ours as well, and I think in every culture. How you speak conveys something, and lofty is going to be dependent on the culture. What does it mean to be lofty, right? Does it mean to be intellectual? Does it mean to be folksy? Does it mean to be hip? Whatever, but whatever way you speak conveys something about what's going on inside of you. And there's a pull to say, Hey, how you speak is a measurement of uh, well, what, you, what you really boast in. What's special about you? What it is that gives you significance. The person who's boasting in the Lord, probably not going to have lofty speech. It even appears that Paul's saying, I on purpose made sure not to talk in a lofty way because I didn't want y'all to think I was boasting in anything else except the Lord. There was nothing else that I thought gave my life significance or would give my life significance. So I didn't want to talk in a way that might betray that. Another thing that, uh, that he highlights here that I think is, uh, goes along with a boaster. When you imagine a boaster, if you just close your eyes and just imagine, or earlier whenever I asked you about that, when you thought of a boaster, what did the person look like? And maybe it actually was somebody. But if you just, if we're in the dictionary and there's a little picture beside the word boaster or boasting, is it some shrimpy little dude who doesn't have good clothes and kind of looks like a dummy? Is that what a boaster looks like? Does it look like somebody who's really scared and intimidated, doesn't know what the, how they're going to be able to handle stuff in their life? Probably not. But notice, what does Paul say? As he was someone who was boasting in the Lord, what does he say he was like when he was with them? Did you notice that? I was with you in fear and much trembling. We actually know it was so bad in Acts chapter 18, Jesus had to personally come and give Paul a vision to encourage him, which didn't happen all the time with the apostles and prophets. He had to tell him, do not be afraid. That's how bad it was for Paul when he was in Corinth. Here's the point. This person who boasts in the Lord is not someone who has this unrattled, self-assured confidence. Boasting in the Lord actually looks like being afraid sometimes. Mm-hmm. All right, so those things that we might think accompany boasting in the Lord, they don't. Fleshly wisdom, worldly power, uh, nobility of, of social expectations, Lofty speech, all that, none, of, none of this stuff is really the way it works whenever you're boasting in the Lord. My guess is you already knew that was not part of boasting in the Lord. So what does accompany it? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
in some respects, we're, we're just uh, highlighting some of the things that we talked about in our Bible study this past Thursday, which was incredible and so encouraging. But I just want to highlight a couple of things from this, where Paul describes us the profile of someone who boasts in the Lord. He says it of himself in 1017. He who boasts, uh, well, verse 16, he says, I'm going not to preach the gospel even to regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he who the Lord commends. So Paul says, this is how I'm trying to live my life. That thing I told y'all in my letter before, that you should boast in the Lord, I'm telling you, that's the way I try to live my life too. Yeah, Paul, I mean, you listed off all the things that don't go along with that, but we're still a little fuzzy on what does it mean? What does it look like to live a life that boasts in the Lord, that celebrates life in the Lord? How do I get there? How do I become a person that would boast in the Lord? Well, let me tell you about it, Paul says. All right, so look at uh, chapter 10 and verse 16. Uh, We've already kind of noted this, but chapter 10 and verse 16. What was it that Paul was doing as he was somebody who boasted in the Lord? He says he was going to preach the gospel. He actually continues this into chapter 11. Uh, He's warning them in the first couple of verses about people who are pulling them away from Christ. And then in verse uh, 4, he says, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Now he's, of course, saying, y'all watch out. You're getting yourselves messed up. But here's the point. Paul's letting us into what, for him, boasting in the Lord meant. Preaching the gospel. Well, what is that gospel, Paul? What is that Jesus that you preach? You're saying we should watch out because there might be another Jesus someone might preach. But what's the Jesus that you preached? What is the answer to that? What's the Jesus that Paul preached? Was he a pretty Jesus? Was he a smart Jesus or an accepted Jesus? Or Paul says, right in the very passage that we started with, just before it, he said, we preach Christ crucified. Amen. Amen. Paul's life of boasting the Lord meant that he proclaimed a crucified And here's the thing, a crucified Lord. He didn't preach a crucified martyr. You know the difference? A martyr is somebody that's a sympathetic figure, right? We're like, man, like I I admire them. I'm inspired by them. It's a bummer they were too weak, that they couldn't overcome what society wasn't ready for them. That's a martyr. A Lord is the one who rules. A Lord is the one that we bow down before in absolute submission. And what Paul proclaimed was not of the wisdom of this world because he proclaimed a crucified Lord. Not only that, a crucified Lord who he believed was his Savior and he told others would be their Savior. How dumb is that? That's what everybody thought. How dumb is that? How could you believe that? Man, we're over here. We've got this philosopher. We've got this political figure. We've got all these people and you're telling me that this, this carpenter from Nazareth, that even his own people wouldn't accept and he was killed, you're telling me that I should bow my knee to him? That's right. Because I'm boasting in the Lord. Paul goes on to talk about what boasting in the Lord looks like or what leads to a life of boasting in the Lord. Look at uh, chapter 11, verse 7. Chapter 11, verse 7. Uh, Part of the issue, we've talked about this, that the Corinthians had or they were being infected with is people were saying, man, I don't know if Paul's very legitimate because he doesn't take money from you guys. Uh, which one may mean he doesn't care about you that much. He wants to keep himself at arm's length. But also, I mean, can you really trust a guy who's not even willing to receive pay for what he does? Come on. It's kind of silly to us maybe, but that was the argument. But listen to what Paul says about this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows that I do. All right, what's the other thing that Paul said as he's living this life of boasting in the Lord? What's the other thing that he says sort of define that? It's not just proclamation of a crucified Lord and Savior. But it was significant financial sacrifice. There's a couple of ways we can think about this. One is Paul just didn't take money. He could have apparently. Apparently they would have given him money if he had tried to get it from them. But here's the other thing. Have you ever thought about how Paul made it, the fact that he was in Corinth for a year and a half, how did he eat every day? 
How do you have a house to live in? How do he deal with all that? What did he have to do in order to survive? He worked. He worked. Now, what that meant was, uh, because there was no other meat. Now, there's a time that he mentions here where some other brethren brought a financial gift, and we know that at that time he was able to just be working and preaching and teaching. But what he did is he worked two full-time jobs. He worked a full-time job of preaching and teaching and doing all that free of charge, and he worked a full-time job of tent making, doing whatever he needed to provide for his needs. That's a significant sacrifice, mostly with financials. If you work two full-time jobs, what kind of salary do you want to be bringing in? You cool with, I'm going to work two full-time jobs, but I'm just going to bring in one salary. Would you be all right with that? <laughs> you already got another job. We don't need to pay you on this one. That's financial sacrifice. And besides that, do you think that he really was just killing it in the tent making game? I mean, just wealthy? No. He was making sacrifices of a financial sort. He was not mighty. He was not powerful. He would not have been influential, at least from a worldly perspective. Because in his life of pursuing a life of boasting in the Lord, he was making significant financial sacrifices. Um, and, and actually, I'll add to this. Not just financial, but apparently reputational sacrifice as well. People here were saying, they were trashing him. They were saying bad things about him. They were saying he wasn't legitimate because he wasn't like these other guys. So it wasn't just the sacrifice of how much money he had in the bank, but also the reputation that he developed in the way that he lived his life. But it didn't seem to matter to him that much. He wasn't mighty. He wasn't influential according to the flesh. But he was okay with it because he saw this as part of the path of boasting in the Lord. How about another one? Look at, uh, we're not going to read all of this, but if you begin in verse 16, Paul, and he keeps saying this thing, he says, man, I, I, this is foolishness. Please suffer with me some foolishness. I really shouldn't be talking this way. It's just foolishness. I shouldn't do it. <laughs> but I'm going to brag a little bit. But he says, I'm going to boast about uh, my weaknesses. We'll talk more about that in a second. But beginning in verse 16 and going almost to the end of the chapter, Paul outlines the types of uh, things that define his day-to-day -day life and bigger picture, what he went through. In his life, I just want to read a, a slight ex excerpt of this, uh, starting in verse uh, 23. He says, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if I'm insane. I more so. I think that's the insanity he's saying. I shouldn't be we shouldn't be comparing each other. But if these guys are doing this, I have to persuade you that, yes, the boast that I'm making is a boast you should pursue. Boasting in the Lord is worth it. Let's keep going here. Um, he says, I speak as if I'm insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten, times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys. That sounds fun, journeys. I like to go on trips, not these kind. In dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul's saying, I've been going through it. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Are you just some sort of masochist? Are you just trying to, just? I don't know, you feel bad about yourself and that's why you're putting yourself through all this terrible torture? No. The reason why is hinted at, although it's really revealed to us throughout the entirety of this letter, but in verse 28, apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? All this life of self-sacrifice, all this life of endangering himself, all these things are things he chose to do. I mean, not that he was asking people to beat him up, but he was kind of asking for it by the things that he was doing. As he lived a life pursuing the Lord, boasting in the Lord, proclaiming the crucified Lord and Savior, making all these sacrifices, he was inviting this kind of suffering. Why? In the service of others. Not to lift himself up through his own nobility, though he had actually great fleshly nobility. He acknowledged that in the verses just before what we read. But he wasn't real interested in boasting in his social nobility through his birth or his associations or his accomplishments. That wasn't it. He thought that boasting in the Lord was more important and the path of boasting in the Lord was marked by the signposts of suffering in the service of others to do good for them. That's what it meant for him to boast in the Lord. And I'll say verses 28 and 29, uh, this letter, 2 Corinthians, 
was written to people to convince him that he loved them. He even has to say that. Earlier in the past we read, did I do this because I don't love you? God knows I do. Why would you bring that up? Unless they weren't sure or they didn't think that he loved them. By the way, did that mean that they were very loving to him? Did people really care about him? It's interesting, in this passage he says, I've got to brag a little bit, which implies to me that at least most of the brethren of Corinth didn't know about this stuff. They didn't know about it. You ever thought about that? I, I mean, I'm sure some did, to be fair, right? But the fact that Paul outlines these things means that there were people here that didn't even know. Imagine if you were traveling to go serve some people, to help some people. Along the way, you got jumped and robbed. You got arrested because they found out you were preaching that Jesus nonsense. You got beaten and pick whichever one, with rods or with whips. And then you carried on and you didn't have anything to eat because, after all, you just got out of getting beaten after being in prison. And you carried on the rest of the way and didn't have anything to eat, had little or no clothes to speak of. And then you get there. And then you started preaching. And nobody asked you, hey, you look a little, you okay? They didn't know this story. They didn't know this stuff. Here's my point. At least to a great extent, the suffering and the sacrifice and the care that Paul showed was unrequited. He didn't receive the same kind of care in return. He did from some people, I want to be clear. It wasn't like he was out here with no friends and everything. But at some times, he couldn't boast in, look at all these people who love me and adore me and support me and are there for me. He didn't have that to boast in. He was just stripped on down with nothing. How about this one? Now, th this next one, you're going to think, actually, this sounds like, like all these other things are kind of bad. Like, you're a dummy because you preach in a crucified Lord and Savior. You uh, don't have much money to speak of. No, like, career success or advancement to speak of. Uh, you've gone through all this suffering and pain and difficulty. You don't have a lot of people in your corner supporting you and all that kind of stuff. This next one sounds a little different. At the beginning of chapter 12, he says, Boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. He then goes on to describe in sort of a strange way, he says, I'm not going to boast for myself, but I'll boast for somebody. Seems pretty apparent he was talking about himself in the third person, that he had this magnificent vision where he had seen things in uh, the heavens and he'd heard things that couldn't even be repeated you might say, okay, well, now we're getting somewhere. That's the good kind of boasting. Except imagine, uh, well, just think about it. Somebody came to you, and they're like, I had a vision. It was a really spiritual, amazing thing. I heard a language you would never be able to understand if I even told you. What would you do with somebody if they started talking to you like that? Like, I think I need to go. I can't do this. <laughs> because that sounds kind of wacko. That's not the wisdom that we all have. Look, we, we all have some established wisdom. We know what's good. We know what's true. You're talking about some otherworldly kind of stuff. We read this stuff from Paul. We're like, yeah, that's a great thing. Paul had this. You know, this is really. But in the world, this looks just wild. I think you got beat one too many times, man. And you're seeing things. You're imagining things. But he's willing to talk about it. Matter of fact, this was, in some part, a great basis for the ministry that he, he did was the visions that he had, a revelation that he had from the Lord. Do y'all see the whole point? The life of the person who boasts in the Lord not only dumps out all the worldly causes that might say, this gives my life significance now, and I think it will take me to a place of significance. We dump all that. Human wisdom, uh, worldly power, fleshly nobility, lofty speech, all that kind of stuff. No, that's not what we're doing here. This is the life of the person who boasts in the Lord. But now, here's the tricky part. Do, does that mean that boasting in the Lord just means I feel really good about some things that I do? Because isn't that how you become kind of arrogant, self-sufficient, uh, a hypocrite? Amen. Look how much I do for Jesus. Except it's not really for Jesus. I just want you to think I'm great. Amen. And that happens. Matter of fact, Jesus attacked this in the strongest terms possible whenever he would address the Pharisees, that they were people who fasted and made all these... They did a lot of things that actually would look a lot like, not quite, they would travel land and sea and all this. It would look a lot like this. So now we're still kind of left with, what does it mean? What, what am I boasting in if I'm boasting in the Lord? Is it that my life has significance because I make sacrifices or I'm struggling financially for Jesus or whatever? 
Is it because I talk about Jesus? Is that, are those things in themselves what it means to boast in the Lord? Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. I mentioned to you earlier that all these things that Paul addresses as he is exhorting the, the saints in Corinth and exhorting us even now. This notion of boasting in the Lord isn't something that um, he just sort of invented as like, oh, this is a good way to talk to him. He took this straight out of this scripture. Jeremiah was a prophet hundreds of years before Jesus had come, and the people of Israel had turned to many other things. They had turned to false gods. They had turned to themselves. They had turned to their history and thought, hey, we're good. We're great. When in reality, they couldn't be more rotten. God actually describes them uh, in, in one place as, as both a prostitute or a woman who's prostituting herself to forsake her husband and like a wild animal who's just running around to all these different things. So you see the point, right? It, it was God used some really terrible images to describe their true nature. And in... Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23, we find our quote. And I think as we read uh, this passage here, it actually will help us to understand how to put all this stuff together we've been noticing um, in, these, in the Corinthian letters. Jeremiah 9 verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, and let not a rich man boast of his riches. Can you hear 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26? Mm -hmm. Not many mighty, not many, uh, uh, excuse me, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Right here. Right out of this. But, let him who boasts, boasts of this. This is where you see Paul kind of slightly modified the quote, knowing that his readers would have understood it already. He doesn't, it's not exactly let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, except it is. Let him who boasts, boast in this. What is the boasting, what does it mean to boast in the Lord? What are we boasting in? What's it all about? What's the thing that gives us significance now and will give us significance as our life moves forward to the other side? What is it? Let him who boasts, boast in this. That he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. Amen. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Amen. What's the thing we're supposed to boast in? It's actually, this is, uh, I think, helps us understand why Paul was talking about all those things that he talked about in 2 Corinthians. He wasn't saying, hey, I proclaim uh, a crucified Lord, and so I boast in that thing. Or, hey, I made a bunch of financial and reputational sacrifices, I boast in that thing, although he was. Or I've, I've, I've done all these sacrifices to serve others and I, I haven't really gotten much out of it and all these things. All those things in themselves are nothing to boast of. They're just things that we do. And that you can do them because you want to gain worldly power or significance or whatever. But if properly exercised, the life that Paul describes of the person who boasts in the Lord the reason why those things are worth boasting about, celebrating, rejoicing, bragging about is because those are the things that make us to know the Lord himself. That's the boast. The boast isn't the stuff I do in the Lord. The boast is that I know the Lord. Does that make sense? You with me? That's what this whole thing is about. And here's the point. You cannot know the Lord if you just sit here couple times a week. You can't know the Lord if you just open up this book. Don't get me wrong. If you're not sitting in here, if you're not opening this book, you're not going to know the Lord either. But that's not enough. To know the Lord is to pursue Him, to embody His character, to, to think on Him, to, to strip away all the things that might pull us into thinking, this is what gives my life significance. This is what will take my life to a place of significance in the future. All that stuff is, the way Paul described in Philippians 3, he said it's garbage. It's garbage because of the surpassing worth of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Amen. That's what it's all about, knowing Him. All the other things, they're going to take us into a path of not knowing the Lord, of knowing darkness and emptiness and meaninglessness and insignificance in the worst and most eternal way possible. 
But what Paul is laying out for us, what the Holy Spirit is teaching us is, hey, proclaim the risen but crucified Lord and Savior. Be somebody who makes financial and reputational sacrifice. Who cares? If you have to give up things in this world and people think you're nothing for it, that's fine. You know what? They said the same thing about the Lord himself. They said he was nothing. They said, can this be the Messiah? He's from Nazareth. We know his mom. We know his brothers. He can't be anything. When people say you can't be anything, great. You're on the path of knowing the Lord, of understanding the Lord. Whenever you experience that, you look at Jesus, you say, that thing that I read about, I get it now because I'm, I feel that. I can't even imagine what it must have felt like for you being the creator of all things to feel this. I'm just a tiny nothing and I feel this way. Whenever you serve and you sacrifice for others and it's unrequited or it's unappreciated or it doesn't go anywhere, man, that's hard. And whenever it is, think, man, how must God feel billions of times over for centuries to be doing all that he can to demonstrate his loving kindness and his justice and his righteousness on the earth. And we just reject it. We just throw it in the garbage time and time again. And whenever you share in that service with God, you know him better. I understand you, Lord. I see what you go through. I I mean, I can't really, but I can imagine at least now because I understand I'm on this path. And my boast is not in my sacrifice. My boast is not in my proclamation. My boast is not in that financial reputation. It's not in those things. It's in that I know you. That's the thing that I rejoice in. I'm not happy about getting beat up. I'm not happy about going through all these difficulties. I'm happy that I know you. That's what I celebrate. That's what I boast in. That's what I rejoice in. That's why back in 2 Corinthians, Paul uses this strange phrase that almost sort of replaces boasting in the Lord. He talks about boasting in in weakness. Look at chapter 11 and verse 30 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 30. If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. In chapter 12 and verse 5, uh, after talking about the visions and stuff, he says, on behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not both ex- boast except in regard to my weaknesses. And then in verse 7, he says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And we might go back to our very first passage. Through lofty speech. No, that's not how I'm going to exalt myself. Uh, Through worldly wisdom, through fleshly nobility, through social power, all that. No, that's not how I'm not... God's making sure I don't exalt myself in that, that I don't boast in those things, that I don't think those are the things that give myself significance now or will give me significance on the other side. Concerning this, verse 8, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Please, Lord, take this pain away. Take this difficulty away. Three times. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses. Why? You just like being weak. You like getting beat up. You like... No, that's not it. It's so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why is it that when you're weak, you're strong, Paul? Because... When I'm weak, I've got nothing left to hold on to. I've got nothing left to stand on. I've got nothing left to give my life significance or meaning or power or whatever except Jesus only. That's what it is. That's what he said back in 1 Corinthians 2. When I came to you, I spoke nothing except Christ. And that wasn't just some sort of rhetorical, oh, this is the best way to build a church community. No, no, no. He was doing that because that's what he believed inside. He was well content with his weaknesses because having all that other stuff stripped away was the path to knowing the Lord and the Lord only. All the other stuff he could know, all the other stuff he could trust, all the other things he could boast in that would make his life mean something now and on the other side meant nothing to him. And so he was happy, not because he was getting beat up and rejected and was poor and lonely and all that stuff, but because he knew the Lord. He knew the Lord. That's why all the stuff that God's given us to do, that's what it's about, is that we would know him. And you may be beaten up. By the way, all the bad stuff that Paul mentioned, 2 Corinthians was written somewhere in between uh, Acts chapters 19 and 20. 
That means all the bad stuff that you think about with the Apostle Paul at the end of his ministry, getting arrested, being shipwrecked, getting beaten up, none of that stuff had even happened yet. My point is, this isn't even the whole of all the suffering you went through. Whatever you may go through in your life, whatever weakness you may incur because you're following Jesus, don't run away from it. Run toward it. Amen. Because that is the path to knowing the Lord, to understanding Him. And that's what our boast is in. That's what this whole thing is about. The past few days I've been, uh, <clears throat> I've been reflecting on this partly from our discussions in our recent classes, but partly because of some, some stories and some events in some of my friends' lives. And I'd like to share a couple of them with you now because they've, I feel like that, that the things that I'm sharing with you now are things that have been taught to me just even more so in the past couple of days. I met John whenever he was um, in college. And uh, I don't remember, maybe Emily and I were probably 24, 25, whatever. We, we were doing this weekend thing at the church where he was. We knew his girlfriend, Reagan, girlfriend at the time. Uh, we didn't know him. And so we showed up, and uh, John was one of those like handsome, but not too handsome. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like handsome to where you're like drawn, but not so, ooh, this is kind of scary to be around this person. Um, you know, like when people are ready to play some kind of sport, he's, he's down, he's ready to do it. Funny, but always in the way that you were never, you were never the joke, you were always part of the joke and right. being brought in. I, it's always fun for me when I go to places for a couple days to preach and teach because you can't know everything about people. People can be fake but if you just watch you can learn some things and you can tell who are the people that everybody else kind of like hey this is the captain of the team I don't think we ever voted but it just happened this is the captain of the team right here he's that kind of guy him and some of his his close friends and after that I really enjoyed our friendship for years he was fun and funny gracious um, and very thoughtful about the Lord's things eager to know more about the Lord and to serve him and to do better. And then several years ago, after John and Reagan had been married for not a very long time at all, uh, it was discovered that John had an incredibly rare form of cancer for which there was no treatment, and the doctors gave him a very short window of time that he would survive. And over time, I mean, they tried all sorts of treatments, and uh, and Thank God, I think really the only treatment that really, really worked was the prayers of the saints and their faith. And it seems, who knows, only God knows, that God granted him an extension of time. I don't know for what reason. Maybe for this reason right here that I'm trying to tell you. Amen. John wasn't all that handsome uh, this summer whenever we saw him. His body looked way different than what the strong body of the man that I first met. There were a lot of times whenever uh, we would talk over the past few years there were just dark times for him. Not that same kind of joy and happiness. Although there was always still uh, uh, hopefulness every time we talked. I'm sure he didn't feel that way always. I'm sure it was hard for him some days. Actually, I know it was. But whenever we would talk, it would always be about the new stuff he was reading in the Psalms. He was preparing some, I don't know what it was exactly, a book, uh, his thoughts, something. Matter of fact, the last time we saw him was this summer. We, uh, we went to Texas for a wedding, and we met up with him and Reagan and their son, Axel, who's about Shay's age. And uh, we met up at a park, and then it was, it was time to go. And uh, I don't know if y'all remember, like Southwest canceled our flight. We were literally on the runway. They canceled it. What are we going to do? Well, John. The guy who's in the midst of a horrifying battle with cancer, struggling every day to keep on going, he came and picked us up and then forced us to let him pay for dinner. And then we stayed with uh, he and Reagan and their family that night. And all the conversation was uh, not, I don't know, maybe it is what you'd expect. It wasn't what I think you would expect for somebody in his situation. From every measurement, his life had lost all significance. 
that engineering career that he had gone to school for, gone. The strength and power he had in the flesh evaporated. Hopes for some kind of great future where people are going to celebrate your accomplishments and all, gone, gone. And yet, uh, I think you know kind of how the story ends. When he passed this past week, it wasn't that... uh, It wasn't that his life was a failure or it was empty. Like maybe you'd have to think if you didn't have the Lord. Because John took all of his weakness... Every bit of it. As a signpost to point him toward knowing the Lord. And as like all the tributes have rolled out. That's the thing that stood out to me. Is that this man knew the Lord. He's not going to know his son grown up. At least not in this realm. He's not going to know all the accomplishments that many of us may have. Or that we may think are important but I'm pretty sure he doesn't care about all that right now because he knew the Lord. And that was his boast. That is his boast now. On the other end of the spectrum of life, my brother, uh, my sister is pregnant. She's actually scheduled almost to have her child the same time as as we are. And my brother-in-law, Nate, wrote something about his dad the other day. I wanted to actually read it. So um, Nate was reflecting as he's getting ready to welcome his child. And uh, it, he has a blog, whatever. He, he's writing. He, I'm, I'm just going to pick up in the middle. It says, fast forward to the day before my dad's, but Nate's father's birthday in 1982. And I come into his life. And I grow and grow. By the time I'm in high school, I'm unusually tall with prodigious jumping ability. Two gifts that are of particular use in the game of basketball. But here's the thing. We'd occasionally shoot hoops together, and he came to every game I ever played. My dad was never the kind of dad who aggressively pushed me into basketball. The main thing I got from my dad was Jesus. Every Sunday morning, there was Bible class and worship service and preaching. Every Sunday night, there was more worship service and preaching. On Wednesdays, there was midweek Bible study. Sometimes, there'd be gospel meetings during the week, and he'd take us all to church for even more preaching. And... He'd also take time to read the Bible with us at home. His main concern was not that I'd be an exceptional basketball player. I wasn't. And it wasn't that I'd get a great job. I didn't. His main concern above all else was that I know Jesus. And I'm talking about Jesus, Jesus. Bible Jesus. There was no angle to it. No, get Jesus and he'll give you lots of money or Jesus is a good way to be a basically good person. It was know the self-sacrificial Jesus who is both Lord and Son of God who invites mankind to live in his kingdom. And that Jesus, 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 teaches a lot of odd counterintuitive things. Love other people the way you love yourself. Give as God has given you. Turn the other cheek. Don't look at women lustfully as if they aren't people at all. He that is greatest among you shall be a servant, and so on and so on. He teaches the kind of things that, if followed, will make you a real weirdo. And I'm not as much of a weirdo as I should be, but I'm trying. (laughs) And now that I'm weeks or days from meeting my daughter, I want to teach her the same truth my dad taught me. If you have Jesus... You have everything. Above all else, know Jesus. Let he who boasts, boast in this, that he knows and understands me. That's what gives our life significance now. And whenever we all meet our day, that's what will give it significance. And whatever weakness, whatever suffering, whatever difficulties, whatever weirdoness we have to live out in this life along the way, it's going to be fine. Because every day, every step, every turn on our path will make us to know him. And that's what we boast in. That's the only thing that will be worth boasting in whenever we get to the other side.
I don't know your story. I know John's story and Nate's stories. I know a little bit about mine so far. But if your story is not a story of knowing Jesus, above all, Jesus only, through weakness, through difficulty, through sacrifice, if that's not your story, that story needs to be rewritten Amen. today, Amen. right now. Amen. And by the power of the Spirit of God, it can be. And actually all our faults and failures and missteps can all be rectified as we come on the path to know the Lord so that our boast will not be in all the things of this world, our successes, our power, our nobility, our wisdom, our what, none of that stuff. But our boast will be that we know the Lord. In just a minute, we're going to uh, uh, sing a song before we take the Lord's Supper. Um, and we do this from time to time. I'm going to do it right now. If you're sitting here and you're saying, man, like I don't, I'm not living a life of seeking to know Jesus. I'm just living for the things in this world. Please, after we get done with it, just come grab one of us. Grab me, grab somebody and say, hey, I need some help. It may be that you don't even know about Jesus from the first place. I don't know how to live this way. I don't know how to know him. I don't know how to make my boast in the Lord so that my life will mean something. It may be that you know it, but you're just not being strong in it and you're not pursuing the real knowledge of Jesus. Whatever it may be, let's not leave this moment in this place without rewriting that story so that our boast will not be in the things of this world, but our boast will be in knowing the Lord.